So this is a multiplayer Jeopardy game I built that lets you play Jeopardy against your friends using your cell phones as buzzers. And in order to build a system like this, you're going to need a different paradigm than just HTTP. So let me show you how this works real quick. And then I'm going to talk about the problem with trying to build something like this with just web requests. So I have a URL that I can go to that asks me to join the game. So I'm going to just click join game and it's going to ask me to type in my name, which I will do at always be coding. And I type it in and notice that my username gets added to the players list without me having to refresh the page. So the app was listening for incoming connections and keeping track of them somehow. So now I'll actually simulate doing a question. I'm gonna do the movie map for 200. And Bill Murray as FDR, Hyde Park on blank. And what notice what happens, my buzzer is gray right now. But when the admin of the game hits activate buzzers, my buzzer turns green and the buzzer on the screen turns green. And if I wanted to buzz in, I would click the green thing here and my buzzer would turn red and everyone else who's connected to the game's buzzer would turn red to know that they're locked out and the screen turns red to let them know that I'm buzzed in. So everyone that's connected to this game is getting the exact same communication instantly. So I know that the answer to this question is the Hudson and I would be correct. My score bet incremented, my buzzer would get back to reset and we could play the game. So let's break this down. When you're first starting out with web development, you don't tend to think about state very much because HTTP is a stateless protocol. What do I mean by that? Well, when you make a web request, that's a static data structure that's getting sent to the server. And then a static response gets sent back and that's it. You're not still connected to the server or anything like that. If the request is the same, the response should always be the same. There's not conditional logic packed away anywhere. The closest you'll get to state is something like whether or not a user is logged in when you make the request. And user sessions are kind of a weird hack to artificially simulate state between the client and server. If you think of how login works on the web, a session token will be stored locally in the user's browser. And then when the HTTP request is made, it will get added to the actual request as a session object. And then the server will check some sort of session storage to check if the session is valid and render either the logged in UX or the logged out UX, depending on whether or not the session was there. But when you need state, like I showed you in my Jeopardy game, where multiple users are connected to the page and can buzz in indefinitely, you're going to want to use a completely different protocol called WebSockets. WebSockets allow for a persistent two-way communication channel between the client and server so they can constantly send data back and forth to each other, and also so the server can broadcast events to all connected clients at once. And there's a litany of applications that require this kind of functionality. Look at something like Facebook Messenger, where it will show you live whether or not someone's typing a response to you. And the message will immediately appear on your screen without having to refresh the page to do it. So that, that's just another example of it. Now, WebSockets are a native feature in all modern browsers, but they kind of suck to deal with. They're really low level and each browser implements them in slightly different ways. So if you wanna build a real time app, you're gonna have some challenges ahead of you. Fortunately, we have some nice weapons at our disposal to fight back with. There's this really nice JavaScript library called socket.io that's pretty popular right now and it wraps each browser's WebSocket implementation into one single consistent API for you to use. So that's a pretty good approach. Also, most back-end web frameworks are starting to have native implementations for dealing with WebSocket communication. Rails 5, that just came out, has the WebSocket library action cable as part of the core code base now, which is really great. Phoenix, the Elixir-based framework, has native support for WebSockets built right into it, which is amazing. But it's still a lot to wrap your head around and a lot to architect when you're just starting out or if you just want to build cool stuff and not have to deal with the low level stuff. 
So finally, there is an even simpler way to get started with WebSockets, and that is by using an incredible service called Firebase. Firebase was a startup that launched in 2012 and then was acquired by Google in 2014. Firebase as a service does a lot of different things, but if there's one thing that you need to know about it, it's that Firebase is the dead simplest way to build a real-time app that has shared state across multiple devices. And I am going to show you how to use it on an Always Be Coding screencast. Hit it! Na, 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 na. Okay, so I am going to make a simple app to monitor a Twitter hashtag and see tweets against that hashtag in real time. And I'm going to use Firebase to do it. So if you go to firebase.com, you'll get prompted with this UI. As of the time I'm recording this, which is August of 2016, Firebase has just made a major update to their UI. So this is a link to the legacy UI, and this is a link to the new one. I'm going to go to the new one. I've never actually used this new UI before, so you get to see me rant about it in real time. I'm going to click go to console. And it's going to ask me to create a new project. When you create a Firebase project, you can think of this as creating a database. You just get all the associated tooling around the database, which is why they call it a project, I guess. I'm going to click on that. And this is free to create, by the way. The free tier on Firebase is awesome. You get a lot of mileage out of it before you need to pay for anything. I'm going to call this screencast. And I'm going to hit create project. So it created the screencast project and it takes me to this new UI. Now there's a lot of stuff on here, analytics, auth, database, storage, hosting. The thing we're interested in is this thing that says database. So this is a UI into our database. You can think of a Firebase database as a single JavaScript object. So this is the actual JavaScript object right here and we have a UI where we can edit it in our browser. Like I could make this go to the value of 10. And now this is just a JavaScript object that has this key and this value of 10. But this object has a superpower associated with it. And that's that any client that references this data store will be updated of changes to it in real time. And that's going to be really powerful as we build out our app. Okay, so now let's look at the UI code. This is just a dead simple react.js app. And in my package.json, I'm including the Firebase JavaScript library. They have updated this recently, so you probably want to use at least version 3.3. In my app.js, now I will import Firebase from Firebase. And there's a configuration file that you're going to need. If I go back to my Firebase console and go to Settings, Project Settings, and then click Add Firebase to your web app, it's going to give you this var config thing. I am going to copy that and I'm going to paste it into my code right here. There's also one other thing I'm going to do. They have by default now in Firebase these authentication settings right here in rules that say if you aren't authenticated, you can't read or write to it. I'm just going to wipe those away by setting read true and write true just to make things easier. I don't really care about authentication. I'm just building something simple. So I'm going to publish that. And now back here, Firebase initialize app, I need to get a reference to the Firebase repo and store that as a variable. So this repository is going to store tweets. So I'm going to call this var tweets ref equals Firebase dot database dot ref. And now this variable has a reference to that Firebase database. Now in a component, in my component will mount, I am going to set a listener on tweets ref by doing tweets ref dot on. And there's a lot of different events you can listen to from Firebase, but the most popular one is the event called value. This will fire once when you initialize the repository, and then once again, every single time a value is updated. So we're going to get every new value being handled by this listener. And we will get a snapshot, which represents the current state of the database. So I'm just going to console.log the snapshot.value so that we can see what this looks like, snapshot.val. So let me save that. And let me then split out our repository here. 
So we see that 10 got logged, because like I said, value is gonna fire once, once the page loads. But if we go back to our database and we change 10 to 15 and hit enter, notice that we got that console logged. So every single time this database value changes, the listener is going to fire with that new value because it has a persisted connection to the database. And that's exactly what we were going for. So when we want to write data to Firebase, they provide a REST API that we can use. But if you're using a backend framework like Rails, they'll probably have a library that wraps that API that gives you a bunch of convenience methods that makes it easier to use. But you totally can just send the normal HTTP request from any language. So I'm using Rails right here. I need to initialize a Firebase client in an initializer. So I can just copy the URL of my database here and paste it in. So now I have a Firebase client initialized. I'm going to add a migration to my model, which is just called tweets, and I'm going to add a Firebase key, which will represent the ID in Firebase, just in case we ever want to access the Firebase record specifically, most likely just so we can delete it. And then our tweet model is going to look like this. We're going to have an attribute called serialized Firebase, which can take a tweet model and just convert it into this data structure that has the ID of the tweet, the username of who tweeted it, the text of the tweet. And then after we create, so I have a script that's just going to monitor the Twitter API for anyone that tweets at a hashtag, and it's just going to create a tweet object in my backend. I'm going to have an after create hook that will then sync that to Firebase, which is a pattern you'll see frequently when you're using services like this. So I will just Firebase client dot push. And remember, the Firebase database is just one big JavaScript object. So whenever you push thing, when you want to have like an array of something in it, you're going to want to nest it under a namespace so that you can push data to other namespaces. So I'm going to nest this under a namespace called tweets and we'll serialize, um, use this serializer to get the data structure we want to push to Firebase. And then this response object will contain the key in Firebase, the ID of it in this data structure here. So I will also update the column with the Firebase key so that that model object has a reference to where it lives in Firebase. And then before destroy, so when I delete something, I want to remove it from Firebase first. So if it has a Firebase key, I'll delete it at this path. And that's all you need to do to set up Firebase integration. So let's test out how this works. So I can run my script right here rake extractors Twitter hashtag, which is a script I made, and I'm going to monitor the hashtag fave seven TV shows, which is a hashtag that a lot of people are tweeting at right now. So the hashtag extractor started and let's see if it pulls up. So it pulled out a tweet. Someone tweeted at it and we saw our Firebase library update because remember this, the after create hook would write the tweet to this database. It's under this tweet namespace and we can see the tweet right here. This guy tweeted at Ken Jennings about it, or this girl rather. And something interesting to note here, this isn't actually an array. Firebase doesn't have implementation for native array data structure. So when you wanna have something that looks like an array, it's gonna give these weird keys to each item instead of just putting the actual data into an array. That's fine because when you destructure this data in JavaScript, it'll destructure it as if it was an array. Normally you don't need to look at these keys or worry about them. But this is what's getting stored in that Firebase key attribute so that we can delete these individually. And look, it looks like we're getting some more tweets in and Firebase is updating. If we actually look at our UI now, we're seeing that the, because the snapshot.val is writing, every single time this updates, we're getting a new, we're getting new information with the current state of the database. So you could see because this is a React.js app, how easy this could be to actually put this in our UI. Instead of just logging the snapshot.val, let's do this.setState where tweets goes to snapshot.val.tweets, just like that. And now if we go back, we'll actually see that we have the tweets in our UI and every single time that a new tweet comes in, this UI is gonna update live because Firebase comes in, that value function fires and then the state gets updated. So we've got friends, Frasier, family guys, seriously? I mean, that's a little weird. But yeah, so that's how easy it is to set up a real time UI just by listening to this Firebase reference and writing to it from your backend.
Now if we go back to the code from the Jeopardy game, we can kind of see what's going on. We have this one variable called game state ref, which is the entire state of the Jeopardy game. And whenever a user logs onto the game, we will push an object with the username and the score onto a child subsection of the game state. So this is just a Firebase utility to access a subsection of the state, in this case, slash connected players, which could just be thought of as a JavaScript property of connected players. We'll get a reference to the ID of that subsection once this is completed, and we can attach a listener on that called onDisconnect, which is a Firebase utility that lets you know that whenever this connection disconnects from the browser, let's just call dot remove and remove it from the state. So this is a great simple way that you can maintain track of every single connected client to your game state. I know that's a really quick overview of Firebase because it has so much more functionality than what I just showed, but I don't wanna overwhelm you. I wanna articulate the point. Firebase is the simplest way to set up any kind of WebSocket communication on the web. And I use it all the time in the real world when I'm building apps. And I hope that's enough to get started with. Yo, sub this channel if you wanna know what's important in the world of software development. I'm gonna be out here in San Francisco curating the Silicon Valley tech scene for the foreseeable future. So might wanna subscribe if you wanna really know what's going on out here. I've got some really great content coming up. You don't wanna miss it. Follow me on Twitter at alwaysbecoding if you wanna get live updates about the videos I'm working on or if you just wanna get in touch. Good stuff coming up. Peace.